here's something that we all have in common. We've all had those embarrassing moments that we laugh about later, <laughs> but we've also had the humiliating or shameful moments that are so painful to remember that we don't speak about them. There are moments that we would give anything to go back and unlive or redo. There was that time my, uh, quote, friend pants me in elementary school, like in second or third grade, in front of a bunch of my friends and a bunch of girls. He didn't just get my pants. He pulled everything down. Everything. I was humiliated. I, I was more than butt naked in front of everybody. I pulled my pants up. I ran off in a full-blown crying of ugly tears. How could I ever show myself in public, Ann? I mean, I just wanted to go into my closet and shut the door. Uh, I didn't go in my closet, but I did run into my room. I, I locked my bedroom and I cried my eyes out. The humiliation in that situation happened to me, but there have been plenty of other shameful moments where they were shameful because of something that, that I did. There's the moment that I went verbally postal on somebody that I loved, and I, I felt like a total jerk afterwards, a total jerk. It didn't take their tears for me to be shocked by myself. It was like I had to look into a mirror and say, yep, I did that. I did that. It was humiliating in my own lack of uh, love. I saw somebody in the mirror that I didn't recognize, and I was horrified at what I saw. Or there was a time that I got in the shouting match with my dad, who had dementia. Now, that's an argument that nobody wins. You can look up my poem, by the way, on YouTube, The Day My Dad's Dementia Disowned Me. Uh, but it could have been titled, The Day I Backed My Dad's Dementia Into a Corner Until It Disowned Me. We're in this series. Uh, it's an eight-week series um, about the book of Mark in the Bible, which tells about Simon Peter. Simon Peter had one of those moments, by the way. We, we know this because he told us about it. He wanted us to know that there's a safe place to take what's, well, what's shameful and painful and to leave it. I mean, I'm not talking about like close it up in the cl closet door and, and shut the door or something. And he wants us to know that while our past, it reminds us of stuff, it doesn't have to define us. So here, here's something, all right? If, if, if you're carrying something today that's shameful or painful, wow, I am so glad that you've joined us because like I said, we're in part seven of a story that should have died in Nero's Rome, but it didn't. It's the story of Jesus Nazareth told by Simon Peter, dictated and edited by John Mark. And it was while Peter was in prison and while modern scholars debate this whole authorship thing, uh, whatever the case is, it comes to us today as the gospel of Mark. Now, Mark, you got to remember, he wasn't writing the Holy Bible. Mark was documenting Peter's experience with Jesus. And Peter gives us the bottom line of his whole experience of Jesus teaching. He, he gives it right up front. Chapter 1, verse 15 of the Gospel of Mark. The time has come. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. The good news, now, all right, th this is... This is important to understand. The good news is not that Jesus died so that you can go to heaven. It's that God revealed himself in Jesus. Jesus came to earth so that you can know what God is like, even in your shame and your pain, even in the moments that you want to go in to the closet and turn off the light and lock the door. God is near. Now, this was difficult for Jesus' followers and his contemporaries to grasp. And perhaps it's even difficult for you to believe. But God the Father is like God Jesus. Jesus said that if you've seen me, then you've seen the Father. So face, turn around, repent, face, and embrace God in Jesus. Let's go back to those embarrassing moments for just a second. What's an embarrassing story from your childhood, or at least one that you're willing to share out loud? Let's talk about that. We got a lot of things, uh, a lot of stories about, well, being embarrassed. Thanks for sharing those.
So previously, in the last episode of You're Not Far, Jesus made his way from Galilee up in the north down to Jerusalem, and he spent a week disturbing the peace. The 12 disciples hoped that the big reveal is going to happen at Passover, and it was, but it wasn't the big reveal that they expected. Mark says, while they were eating, Jesus took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, take it, this is my body. And then he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank from it. This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many, Jesus says. If it was a covenant between God and, like, everybody, then what about the kingdom? It turns out there wouldn't be one. Jesus was arrested, and, well, everybody deserted him and fled. It was over. He was no king, and there'd be no kingdom. It was obvious God was not near. God wasn't near. And this was a low point that led to an even lower point for Peter. But how did Peter learn about the details of what happened next? Well, maybe it was because some of the religious leaders became Jesus' followers and told Peter. But what would cause them to do this? Well, that's what we're going to talk about next week, so don't miss the exciting final conclusion of You're Not Far next week, episode 8. But back to the story, uh, Peter tells Mark, they took Jesus to the high priest and all the chief priests, the elders and the teachers of the law, and they, they came together. Peter followed Jesus at a distance, right into the courtyard of the high priest. There he sat with the guards and warmed himself at the fire. Mark might ask Peter, are, are, you, are you sure you want to include that part? I mean, this is where it gets kind of embarrassing, Peter. I mean, I've heard you tell this before, but do you really want me to write it down? And Peter would have said, yeah, I, I, I wasn't the hero. In fact, there were no heroes. And so Peter continues to tell the story. The chief priests and the whole Sanhedrin, they're, they're looking for evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they didn't find any. And many testified falsely against him, but their statements did not agree. And the high priest realizes, listen, we're wasting time. And so he gets in Jesus' face and he says, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent and he gave no answer. And again, the high priest asked him, are you the Messiah, the son of the blessed one? Now, Jesus' destiny hung in the balance of his answer. In fact, Peter would... Peter would say, um, not just his destiny, but mine and yours too. So Jesus says, I am. I am. Now the high priest tears his clothes and he says, why do we need any more witnesses? You have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? And they all condemned him as worthy of death. And then some began to spit at him, and they blindfolded him, and they struck him with their fists, and they said, prophesy, and the guards took him and beat him. Mark may ask Peter again, are you sure you want to include this? And Peter probably said, yeah, listen, people need to know this. They need to know how far God's grace and mercy extend. I did the unthinkable and the unpardonable. And while Jesus was being interrogated, I did nothing. Even worse, I warmed myself next to the fire, looked out for number one. So one of the servant girls of the high priest came by, and when she saw Peter warming himself, she looked closely at him and said, you also were with the Nazarene Jesus, but he denied it. And Peter told Mark, listen, I stepped away from the fire so it's not to be recognized, but she followed me. And she said to those uh, standing around, listen, uh, this fellow is one of them. And I denied it again. And the others started staring at me and they said, surely you are one of them for you're a Galilean. And I began to call down curses and I swore at them. I said, I don't know this man that you are talking about. And then at at that moment, a rooster crowed. (laughs) And I remember Jesus had predicted I would do this. And I broke down and I wept. That was a moment that Peter would give anything to go back and to unlive or redo. It's shame, it's pain, it's humiliation. His lack of loyalty had just been pantsed for everyone to see. 
His disloyalty stood naked in the courtyard. I wonder if you've ever been in a situation where you denied Jesus or you had been unwilling to say that you were a Christian. Let's talk about that. So Jesus was taken to Pilate and the religious leaders didn't have authority to execute him, or at least that's what they were saying. And they felt like they needed Pilate's permission. So the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. And Pilate asked them, are you going to defend yourself? But Jesus didn't make any reply, and Pilate was amazed. Now, listen, this is usually when a courageous uh, guy would beg for a quick death, because Roman crucifixion was horrible, and it extended out over many, many days. It was actually a, a way of execution by essentially exposure and asphyxiation. But Pilate knew that Jesus didn't deserve death, and so he had him flogged, and he thought that would be enough, but it wasn't. So he goes back to the crowd and the chief priest, and he says, what shall I do then with the one that you call the king of the Jews? And they yell out, crucify him. And so the soldiers lead Jesus away and called together the whole company of soldiers. Now, these are not actually Roman legions, uh, some scholars think. They were auxiliary soldiers drawn from neighboring regions who hated Judeans. And the idea of a Jewish king was disgusting to them. And it explains the cruelty and the violence that they, uh, they unleashed on Jesus. So they put a purple robe on him and they twisted together a crown of thorns and they set it on his head and they began to call out to him, Hail, King of the Jews. And again, they struck him on the head with a staff and they spit on him. And when they had mocked him, they took off the purple robe and they put on his own clothes and they brought Jesus to the place called Golgotha and they crucified him. Now, Mark and Peter don't give a whole lot of details here because no details were needed. Everybody had seen and been familiar with the crucifixion. And our modern portrayals, even they glamorize them, they romanticize it, they sand off the rough edges. It's like the crosses on my back wall. And in that moment, when God was most glorified, we would have been mortified. We would have all turned our heads around and looked the other way. But the crowd continues to hurl insults. So you're going to destroy the temple and build it in three days. Come down from the cross and save yourself. He saved others, they said, but he can't save himself. Looking back, Peter understood Jesus' desire to save others was precisely why he didn't save himself. If he had saved himself, he would have been unable to save others. He would have been unable to save me. He would have been unable to save you. But they weren't finished. They said, let this Messiah, the King of Israel, come down now from the cross that we may see and believe. Wow. They had no idea how significant these words were. Watching from the back of the crowd, Peter didn't either. What he saw two days later explains why he still believed 30 years later. At noon, darkness came over the whole land. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, Peter knew why. Uh, upon reflection, many years later, he explained the answer in a letter that he wrote. Uh, the father had forsaken the son because he himself bore our sins in his body on the cross. Jesus absorbed into his own body the sin and the rottenness of all creation, including your and my most embarrassing secret moments. The moments that we want to throw in the closet, turn off the light and shut the door. The embarrassing and secret moments that put distance between God and between us. You know how when you've done something wrong, you instantly feel distance between you and that person? Well, on the cross, in Jesus' very own body, he absorbs that distance. He absorbs that brokenness, that, that disease of sin. And he closes that gap and repairs the relationship. I wonder when was there a time that your shame or guilt created distance between you and somebody else or between you and God. Now that's a kind of sensitive subject. So if you want to anonymously confess those or anonymously share that story, you can text us as well. Otherwise, write in the comments, send me a private message. Let's talk about that. Jesus became our sin so that he, that is God, 
could draw near to us so that you would never be far from God. Now, some Christians interpret this as the moment in which God the Father letting out all his anger and, and wrath. wrath on God the Son. But I'll tell you what, this um, way of thinking about this moment on the cross, it's always struck me as, well, kind of abusive. But when you consider the Christian belief that Jesus is God in the flesh, then it, it looks more like God taking on sin in himself, choosing to forsake his own purity for the sake of a relationship with us. The character of God took on flesh, even to the point of taking on our sin, so that flesh might take on the character of God. But in the moment that this took place, nobody watching it understood that. Nobody knew it, not even Peter. And with a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last. Peter would say they found out later something extraordinary had happened. But in that moment, God created a divine visual aid. It was sort of like divine vandalism. Peter tells us that the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. You see, there were two curtains. Uh, one was visible to the public, and the other was between the interior and the holy of holies. The old was ending. Something new, something better, and all-encompassing had come. There'd be no more separation between God and humankind. The covenant between God and the human race was officially ratified. Everybody was invited to participate in it. Peter would say, even I, even I who had been disloyal to the king and deserved banishment from the kingdom, did not get what I deserved. And Peter includes himself in this statement. He bore our sins in his body on the cross. He included his sin and your sin. And, and Peter, listen, Peter didn't learn this from reading the Bible. He experienced face-to-face -face forgiveness and restoration by his resurrected rabbi and friend. The message is clear. That same forgiveness and restoration is available to you because the time indeed has come. The time has come, Jesus says. The kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. You are never far. You are never so far away from God that you can't just turn around to find God ready to embrace you. Peter would tell us, if you've seen what I saw, you would indeed believe this good news. Listen, we'll pick up the storyline right there uh, next time as we conclude You're Not Far. But before I go, I would be remiss if I didn't give you an opportunity to personally receive the gift that Jesus made available to the entire world, the gift of forgiveness. It's the gift of reconciliation, making things right with God. You see, if there's something that you've done like Peter that's so embarrassing that you can't say it out loud, but you need to confess it, then confess it through an anonymous text confession. We've given you several opportunities through this message today, through this episode to, to share that, but, but maybe there's something that is still weighing on your heart. It's still the shame in the closet. Text that in, 507-788-3642. I don't know who you'll be. I'll only know a phone number. The only time I ever like look up phone numbers is if you say you're going to hurt somebody else or you say you're going to hurt yourself. Otherwise, it's totally anonymous. Maybe you weren't the one who got pantsed. You were the one doing the pantsing of somebody else. You went postal on somebody that you loved. You shouted at your family member who had dementia. You looked in the mirror and what you saw was a monster. And if it dawned on you that you actually believe or you believe again, that Jesus is who Peter says that he is, the risen Savior and Son of God, I'd like to lead you in a simple prayer. Whether you're watching alone or with family or friends, would you pray this prayer with me either out loud or, or just silently in your own heart? Heavenly Father, like Peter, I believe Jesus bore my sins in his body on the cross. I place my faith in him as my forgiver and leader, my Savior and my Lord. Thank you for forgiving me of my sins. 
I give my life to you. Help me to live differently. In Jesus' name, all who agreed, typed or said or tweeted, amen. For those of you who prayed this maybe for the first time or, or for the first time in a long time, please don't miss the exciting conclusion of You're Not Far, which is next week. And be sure to fill out our connection card and check on the box that I'm interested in becoming a follower of Jesus. That'll encourage you. And it'll also encourage me 